Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, wait here. No, I'm Jerry there. Cuomo. I'm the uh, vice president of IBM Blockchain and an IBM fellow, so it's my pleasure today to talk to you about how blockchain for business is not going to, but is already changing your everyday life. All right, so let's get right going here. This is a quick kind of walk through how we got to this very stage here. You probably know that IBM has been involved with the last two major, I would say, waves of transaction processing. You know, the mainframe was wave one, wave two is web-based transaction processing. And to be quite frank, we were wondering if there was going to be a wave three. And then we saw a new way, a new way to transact with Bitcoin. And we got excited, not so much because of cryptocurrency, but thinking about if, if Bitcoin was one of a thousand applications, what about the other 999? And then there was a breakthrough. Ethereum with smart contracts. Then we fell in love. We said, okay, now there is a way to customize the transaction logic needed to address use cases broad and wide. But we had some work to do. We reimagined Bitcoin, I mean, sorry, blockchain for business from the ground up. And we did it in open source, part of the Linux Foundation, and specifically I'm talking about Hyperledger and Hyperledger Fabric as the operating system that currently powers 1,100 networks on the IBM blockchain platform. Now, 10% of those networks are what we call live consortia networks. And I have Vinny here today that's going to tell you in detail about one of them. So, as I said, blockchain is not going to, but it is changing everyday life. So I have a couple of questions to ask you and quick stories to tell you. Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever grabbed a sandwich, chicken sandwich, at um, the airport here in Vegas, an hour later? Maybe you're getting on the plane and you're not feeling so well. How many of you have actually gotten sick from eating bad food? Yeah, so I don't know how many remember this, but in 2006, there was an E. coli breakout that was kind of you know, epic and really put this issue on the map. With, um, it took two weeks to pinpoint the source and during that time, people got sick. A few people died, actually. And spinach was basically eradicated because we could not find the source. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to say that everyday life is now changing for the better with the Food Trust Network, convened and co-convened by IBM along with these reputable food companies. And when you think about it, when you think about a supply chain, and you think about the aggregate of the supply chains for all of these companies, you now have hyper-visibility, right? That really allows you, with blockchain, to quickly pinpoint the sources of contaminated food, really limiting the number that get sick, people get sick or die for foodborne illnesses. So how does this work? With blockchain, and we actually have Carrefour in one of the, the participants, in, in, in Europe who actually have a mobile app where you scan the package, let's say that chicken sandwich package, and you can see the ingredients, where they came from. How did they get to that store shelf? You can see that whole aggregated supply chain. So you can see maybe the, where the lettuce was, the mayonnaise, the chicken, and find out, again, if there's a, a bug or a, a, a defect in the supply chain, i.e., you know, you want to do a recall, it's, it's possible. Really for tracking and tracing is the use case here. And you're going to hear a version of this, not with food, but with oil and gas from Vinny in a second. Walmart did an A-B test, right? They went into a store and they picked up a bag of sliced mangoes and they tracked it, you know, from that store to the mango farm. It took seven days on this network. Again, in this hyper-aggregated um, supply chain, 2.2 seconds. I hope you'll agree that that's the first example of blockchain being here and taking a run at changing everyday life for the better. So that's example one. Example two, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever filled out an application to rent an apartment? Right? And then seemingly, you're asked for every bit of information from all walks of life. 
your cell phone? You know, what's your phone number? Where do you bank? <laughs> Where's your license? Where do you live? I don't know about you folks, but my digital life is a mess. I have information scattered all over the place. <laughs> and as you go through this process, you then, maybe a couple of weeks later, unfortunately get one of these. Oops, we're sorry. Someone stole your data. We'll be trying to be more careful next time. Ladies and gentlemen, this is unacceptable in this modern time, and it's really the bane of this digital era that we're living in. But again, I would say, and you've seen statistics like this, I can only imagine what it is today. The days of big data breaches, I'm proud to say, are numbered. In Canada, there is a blockchain network called Verified Me. It is convened by a company called SecureKey and hosted by the seven major banks. And with this and blockchain, we've eliminate, we're eliminating honeypots of data, you know, those big databases with bullseyes on them saying, you know, steal me, right? Instead, your identity is kept on the Verified Me mobile app on a secured, in a secured uh, encrypted wallet. Now it's true, everyone in Toronto um, could lose their phone, let's say next Thursday, <laughs> but that's probably not likely, right? So avoiding a centralized database. People think, do you put the identity information on the blockchain? No, we put proofs and permissions. So in this case, this fine lady here will give the apartment office permission to ask the bank for, to verify the information that they're giving. And also similarly give permission to the bank to respond to the department of, the apartment office. The National Institute for Standards and Technology set a holy grail for information traceability or lack thereof. And they call it triple blind data exchange. In this verified me system, it supports this. So meaning, the apartment office knows that it's a tier one bank giving them information, but it doesn't know who you bank with. Similarly, the bank doesn't know where you're getting your apartment, that's double blind, and triple blind is the network provider doesn't know either, so IBM and secure key, right? Eliminating. Also, with zero knowledge proof, a technique that is used in this system, only the information that's necessary to get your application through is provided. Meaning, like if you have a driver's license, you see your address, but it, you also see the color of your eyes. And that's unnecessary information to share. And you can imagine as you get to important financial information that you don't want to share everything, just what's absolutely needed. So with these three techniques, we've taken a giant step in Canada to eliminate identity theft, and that's a big deal. So, all these things have something in common. They're examples of how trust can be built through a blockchain that has been created from the ground up for business. And as I said, that thing has a name. It's called Hyperledger Fabric. It is that blockchain. It enriches traditional, what I would say, the, the blockchain under Ethereum and Bitcoin with the following four items. It provides accountability. So members of the network are known. They're not anonymous like in, in, in Bitcoin and Ethereum. That's why you've, you've heard the term permission blockchain. These blockchains support, while members are known, they support confidential exchanges. If you've used Slack, these notions of channels, we support transaction channels to scope the transactions. These use cases, you can imagine, require and have a, an insatiable appetite for performance. Hyperledger Fabric can support thousands of transactions per second. Also, it just has to keep running, right? So if one of the members of the consortium is not keeping up to date with Linux patches and their machine stops, the network can't stop. It just has to be fault tolerant and keep running. So we've added these capabilities. And this is our stack. This is what you're going to hear Vertrex running on. It is centered with open source, with the um, Hyperledger fabric. On the bottom is Kubernetes. Right? We've containerized Hyperledger fabric. And we have a series of tools 
for developers through VS Code, operation, governance, and these tools are written in a way that generate 100% Hyperledger fabric artifacts, so we're not locking you in. If you want to take this and run it someplace else outside of IBM blockchain platform, you can. IBM also brings services to the table. We've en engaged over um, 1,000 clients around blockchain projects. And we're not just walking the walk, we're talking the talk. We're not just saying, we'll consult with you and you can run on our platform, but we're actually doing it ourselves. Right? We're actually, with the Food Trust Network and with Trade Lens, we're actually helping co-convene networks. And this is really the spice at the end of the day, the 100 live networks. And you see over supply chain and provenance there, Vertrax. So I want to invite one of my colleagues and one of our customers on the stage, uh, Vinny, to actually tell you about the Vertrax network and what he's doing around supply chain, oil and gas. Thank you, Vinny. Thanks a lot, Jerry. Uh, How do I do 11 this? 11 minutes, not, not just, just, just the green button. The green button. Okay, let's move on from that picture. Um, let me spend a couple of minutes just introducing Vertrax, but I really want to spend the rest of my 10 minutes or so discussing the, the blockchain, the IBM blockchain platform use case that we are now beginning to roll out into production. It's early days, but we're getting a lot of tremendous traction. People are already seeing benefits today. So Vertrax is a software company. We're based in Connecticut. We're all about oil and gas, but in particularly, we're all about the oil and gas bulk liquid distribution supply chain. It's a lot of words, but it really means how does bulk liquids like crude oil, natural gas, natural gas derivatives like propane, frack gas, and all the commodities that go, that go into fracking, for example, like water, specialty chemicals, sand, how did those commodities move from upstream, which is the, ex, you know, that's the exploration, part of the supply chain. That's where stuff gets dug out of the ground. That's where it gets refined. How is that stuff moved and transported and measured as it makes its way down, down to the retail, down to the consumer, whether that consumer be a gas station, a small business, a school, a residential home that uses you know, propane or heating off a home heat, whatever it may be, that's a long journey that that liquid takes. It's a very complex supply chain, and it has um, thousands and thousands of what we call participants. A participant could quite easily be a rail car, a trucking company, a storage facility, a middleman, whatever it may be. Before I get to the use case, Vertrax has three particular platforms. One is a transportation management platform that manages the, the trucking logistics for those bulk liquids from upstream to the residential downstream. We also have a very innovative IoT, sonar-based IoT platform that accurately measures the inventory liquid level of every liquid in that supply chain, from a 20-pound barbecue cylinder that you might have at home and your barbecue from, all the way through to you know, tanks of crude oil and natural gas and jet fuel and diesel that can actually store hundreds of thousands per gallons. So we have an IoT device and an IoT platform based on sonar technology that does that. But I'm here to talk briefly and touch upon the third, the third platform we have, which we built in partnership with a company called Chateau Software out of Westport, Connecticut, and in partnership with IBM and AWS, is the Vertrax blockchain. Let me quickly walk you through that journey and how we got to where we are today. What is the problem? When we went to our customers two years ago and said, guys, we got all this IoT stuff figured out, we got all the transportation stuff figured out, what else do you really need? Coming back from large companies, you know, the Chesapeake's of this world, to small residential propane companies was one thing. We have no visibility in our supply chain. There is no accountability. I don't know where my liquid asset is at any given point in time. And that's a real problem when days are good. In times of disruption, that's really bad. And what I'm trying to say here is that each one of these participants, 
And this is a very high level diagram. It's a very complex supply chain. But every participant, every trucking company, transportation company, pipeline, barge, ship, all have IT systems. Great. And once an asset passes through that supply, through that one particular IT system, it's fine. It, you know, that participant can see it. But, that, but nobody else in that supply chain, no other participant can easily access that data. There's no centralized repository. There's no data warehouse across the supply chain that allows people in a safe, accountable, permissionable way to provide and donate data to that data warehouse and then have companies build analytics on top of that to create value. So they also said, but there's other things that we need before, you can, before we start talking this data warehouse project. One is you have to be multi-cloud. You just can't restrict us. All these participants have various clouds, whether it be AWS, Google, Azure, private clouds, different public clouds. They, they, they will never you know, be dictated to in terms of what, what, the, what the system. So any application or any platform that we built needed to be work in a hybrid cloud environment. They needed permission structures. Everybody said, I'm willing to share my data, and I'm willing to put it on the same data warehouse as my competitors. But I don't want my competitors seeing my data. So it really needs to be in a very permissionable fashion. I want only the right people to see the right data. It also needs to be secure and it needs to be scalable. So we looked at this stuff and we, we partnered with, um, like, like I said, this company called Chateau Software of Westport and we began to look around and we, this thing could be done with regular client server technology at the time. Data warehouse, it, we, we soon realized that we're gonna take t t forever to do cost of fortune, who's gonna do the data scrubbing, the security, the permissionable structure, who's gonna convince all these participants to connect into this data warehouse. So we came across blockchain, and then we said, okay, that sounds great, but which blockchain do we really look at? Do we look at, so we sat down and you know, we, you know, we looked at Ethereum platform, we looked at the IBM blockchain platform and quickly realized that what we really needed was a business blockchain, a B2B blockchain that had real stuff out of the box. We also weren't willing to go into a 12, 18 month development project to get to MVP. That really wasn't what it's all about. We needed development tools and expertise and a company that's actually done it before. But the curveball was we needed it to be done in AWS because we're an AWS shop and our first non-IBM cloud customers that are using this are also on, I should have put that up before, on an IBM, they're on an AWS cloud. And nobody to this day, I still think it's a true valid statement, nobody today has gone live in production with a IBM blockchain platform on an AWS production cloud infrastructure. We have proved out the hybrid cloud, the multi-cloud strategy that all our customers want. So we started this project, and I've got a couple of minutes left. We started this project, it's a very real project, and the use case that we're currently working on, again, it's early days, and we're working with now all the large oil and gas companies throughout the globe to evangelize this platform and look for other use cases that we can work and partner with together to solve serious problems. But we're talking with a, a very large national top 10 propane marketer. They've got uh, 15 participants in their supply chain. Every one of them is, is now getting onto the Vertrax blockchain by providing data as we need it. We're now building analytics on that data. It's taken us a year to get to where we are today. And through, through this analytics, we're now providing visibility into things like supply and demand. Suddenly, for the first time, participants in this supply chain can actually look at their supply and demand curve. And that is a big, big financial bottom line. Um, that's a big driver of people's profits. The other big benefit we're seeing is that without this, and in a very, and in a very dark, in a very, 
uh, dark supply chain, payments. Scheduling of payments, reconciliation of payments is a very lengthy process that actually takes up tremendous cash flow and keeps cash flow locked up for, for weeks and, and sometimes months. With the smart contracts, with the, some of the technologies and tools that we've built, we're now able to settle out transactions in, in, in a fraction of a second. I'll stop here because I know I've hit my time, but I just, you know, this is, uh, you know, come to, to the dinner tonight. We can, we can talk more about it, and uh, hopefully that was it. Yep. Good. So just in closing, thank you. And for, you know, depending on what gene types you have, some combination, if you're a developer, check out our VS Code extension and start building some smart contracts imme uh, immediately. IT leaders, Check out the IBM blockchain platform. It's free for a month. And those business aligned folks, there's a book. In fact, I'll be signing and giving some of these books away our, at our booth, which is right behind us over there right now. So if you like a signed copy of Blockchain for Business, come on over and thank you. Thank you, uh, Amazon. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Vinny, again. Thank Take you, care. gentlemen. Have a good afternoon.